Hi, this presentation is on Hurricane Katrina, which made landfall in 2005 by Leanna Shervenak for Intro to Meteorology, Professor Jordana Sher Mohammed. I like this image of Hurricane Katrina as a Category 5. You can see how massive this storm was and how much it took up of the Gulf. You can also see how many states were impacted by this storm. I wanted to show you the track of Katrina, which you can see on the left. And then Picayune, Mississippi is where my mom's house was, which just slightly north of that between Picayune and Hattiesburg is Poplarville, Mississippi, where I was currently living and going to high school at my dad's. So that kind of just shows you where we were in the path of things. So like I said before, my name is Leanna Shervenak and I chose Hurricane Katrina who made landfall in 2005. I chose this storm because it changed my life, my family's life and my community's life. You know, there's a saying pre-Katrina and post-Katrina and even 15 years later, that's still very true. Our life was turned upside down, and everything we did after Katrina was different in so many ways. The storm took out a lot of people's homes, their jobs, their vehicles, even some of their loved ones, their animals. It was a massive storm that created major damage, lifelong damage. So the year that Katrina hit, I was in high school. It was my senior year. And at the time, I was living in Poplarville, Mississippi. My mom, with my dad, my mom was living in Pinckneyville, Mississippi. We, at that time, we really didn't understand how severe Katrina was going to be. And, of course, as a teenager, I really wasn't aware and I remember my mom calling me, and she was just like, hey, look, your grandma wants to evacuate, and you know, she's nervous, we're going to take her, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, sure, I don't have anything else to do, school's out. And I packed like one outfit, never imagining what was going to happen. So we had a horrific story with evacuation that I can't even begin to get into details of everything, but we finally made it to Albany, Georgia. The people in Al Albany were amazing to us, literally amazing. I can't even get into that as well. I mean, this is a lot of information to put in a very short amount of time, so I apologize. Um, so anyway, we were in a hotel, and during the storm, a lot of things occurred. But the last thing that happened, I was on the phone with my sister, and I just heard her scream, the roof is ripping off, and the phone went dead. And that was it. So we weren't able to get back for over two weeks. Nobody was allowed to enter the area. And you, there was no power lines. There were no cell phone towers, nothing. So you couldn't get a hold of anyone. Every morning we used to get up and go to the Red Cross. And we would check their list. So they had a list of people who had been found deceased and people who were considered missing. And that's what we went and checked every day to see if it was anybody that we knew. We finally were able to get back. And on the way back, I remember being very confused. You know, it's very hard to explain it. But when everything is gone... When the trees are gone, the signs are gone, like every sign. Buildings are gone. Nothing looks the same. You know, I was traveling down roads that I had traveled my entire life, and I had no idea where I was. It was very confusing. It was devastating. And it even confused all of the animals and plants. I mean, there was plants that were blooming at the wrong time of the year. Like, everything was just insane. So, thankfully, we made it home, and we were very blessed compared to many people. My mom's roof had been partially ripped off, so there was damage inside the house, um, sheetrock, furniture, that type of thing. But, structurally, she was still sound. Same thing with my dad. 
in his house, and we were very blessed. There was a lot of us who were not, unfortunately. Like my cousins, I had some cousins who lost everything, aunt who lost everything, just a slab left of her home. They were in areas like Metairie, Louisiana, had much more devastation than we did. And we just we just felt like we were very lucky. Our, our neighbor had put on a blue roof for us, so that helped keep things at bay until we could get back in there. So um, we were very lucky to all the people who came to our aid. My uncle came down from Maryland. He brought an RV, so we were able to get a shower. We didn't have power for over two months. And I just remember the interstate, for as far as you could see, was filled with trucks. Filled with power, power line, power, um, utility trucks, um, dump trucks, freight trucks, um, ambulance. I, I mean, you can't imagine. It was like out of a movie the amount of people who showed up to help us, and that's something that I will never forget and that I will never take for granted. I remember when we were driving down the coast, like Gulfport, Biloxi, after the storm, and I just cried. I just cried and cried the entire way because all these beautiful century homes, these beautiful, booming, fun casinos, these restaurants that I had grew up my entire life seeing were completely wiped out gone slabs nothing and that was just such a a huge part of my past was just taken and knowing that those people were hurting in that way is devastating but now you know things have recovered there and things are booming and beautiful again and a lot of New Orleans I mean you can walk down the French Quarter and you wouldn't know what had happened there but then there's also other areas like New Orleans East that there's still some places that are just the same as they were after the storm. So it's it's interesting to see how things have progressed 15 years later. You know, this was a historical storm, and it's something that we will never, ever forget. But thankfully, we learned a lot from this storm, and we saw a lot of love and humanity come out of it. And I definitely won't forget that. Hurricane Katrina started as a tropical wave and Depression 10 merging together into Depression 12 on August 23rd, 2005. Katrina first developed into a hurricane on August 25th. She made landfall on August 25th, 2005, northeast of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Her second landfall was in Louisiana near Plaquemines Parish. And the third landfall was in Louisiana and Mississippi on the border. Just to kind of put into perspective the damage that Hurricane Katrina did, um, she moved across Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi. She impacted Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. Uh, She was the costliest storm to hit the United States still in 2020. Um, Listed as one of the top five deadliest hurricanes on record. Cost over $100 billion. I believe the number is 108 um, dollars and more than 1,800 people lost their lives. There are also several hundred people still labeled as missing. The forecast was considered a success in the 2005 standard, but today's standards, 15 years later, um, it is not considered a success. We've thankfully advanced um, our technology and and learned a lot over the years, and now we can do a better prediction, which saves a lot of lives. Just a side random bit of information, since I'm a dental hygienist in the dental world currently, um, during Katrina, like many other emergency disasters with mass casualties, the emergency mortuary services is deployed and a lot of people were identified using dental records. Um, That actually triggered my interest as I got older with dentistry and emergency management and services and so I looked into at one point joining the Florida Emergency Mortuary Operations FEMORS. Um, I ended up not going through with it because things just got a little bit crazy and we ended up moving but if that's something that anybody is interested looking more into it's a pretty fascinating thing and it's an amazing thing that people do. Very hard job um, but a very 
needed job. And even if you're not in dentistry, there are other avenues of that that you can volunteer and work for them. So I just thought that would be something to mention. Here's just a little bit more about the storm's details in meteorology. The pressure of Hurricane Katrina dropped as low as 902 at one point as a Category 5. It jumped back up to 920 as a Category 3 when it made landfall. The storm surge was as high as 20 feet in Mississippi. Maximum wind speeds of 140 were recorded. She produced 11 tornadoes. The highest rainfall was 7.8 inches in 48 hours. Wave height was 55 feet, one of the greatest ever recorded. And the levee breaches and flooding were monumental during this time, which some of you may be aware of that. This is just some photos I wanted to show y'all that I found online from history.com in ABC7. You can see, I'll start on the upper left, you see um, a levee breach with the water flooding in. You see some survivors on a roof in New Orleans. You can see the oil and the gas in the water, which I tried to find and I wasn't able to. When I worked for an emergency response company, um, the cover of one of our proposals was a photo and it was where the oil and gas and pollution had been in the water it had caught on fire. So you've got all of this flooding and the water is on fire and it was just an insane thing to see. Um, then we see some men in Walmart. Unfortunately, during that time, you can see this store looks pretty trashed. Um, during that time, it was pretty rough. There was a lot of areas that were having uh, looting. People were fighting over things. There was people getting shot over ice, shot over gas and water. Um, so people were very, you know, on high alert and they were carrying weapons with them at that time. You can see down on the lower left, we have, um, people spray painting for help and who they had in the home. Um, I, I remember for years after the storm, you would drive by houses and they would have the little X that would tell you if that house had been searched, if it was searched, what survivors were there. Um, that type of thing. So it was, um, and if it was deemed, you know, hazardous or whatever, it was a very um, crazy thing to see that for years after the storm. Um, you can see in the next picture here, a home on fire, a man watching it, standing in that water. It's awful. And the very last one, a lady walking down the Mississippi Gulf Coast in a neighborhood and um, the house is just being rubble. And I can't even imagine what she felt like. As, as bad as I felt, and we were very blessed, I can't imagine how bad that must have felt. As I stated before, Hurricane Katrina was a very complex storm, um, but basically what happened was it was a tropical wave and tropical depression 10 that merged together and became tropical depression 12. Katrina developed as a tropical depression southeast of Nassau on August 23rd, 2005. It was changed to a tropical storm the following day. It proceeded to move west and strengthened to a Category 1 on August 25th, where it made landfall in Florida. It began to decrease over land, but once it hit the warm Gulf waters, it intensified. It proceeded west on the mid-level ridge centered over Texas and then weakened it, pushing Katrina northwest and then north, thus weakening the ridge for the following days. On August 26th, the upper-level anticyclone over the warm Gulf waters intensified rapidly, creating a massive hurricane. By August 28th, it dropped in pressure and graduated to a Category 5, which was its peak. When it reached Louisiana that night, it decreased to a Cat 3. Even with the drier air in the open eyewall, it was severely devastating for the area. It then proceeded to weaken and head north until it dissipated. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the causation and the reasons why Hurricane Katrina was so severe. So I wanted to use a direct quote from Noah. According to Noah, even though weakening before landfall, several factors contributed to the extreme storm surge. The massive size of the storm, the strength of the system, Category 5, just prior to landfall, the 920 central pressure at landfall, and the shallow offshore waters. Entire towns were obliterated. A number of factors contributed to making Katrina a strong Category 5 hurricane, even though weakening to Category 3 just prior to landfall. Sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico were 1 to 2 degrees Celsius above normal, and the warm temperatures extended to a considerable depth through the upper ocean layer. 
also Katrina crossed the loop current, a belt of even warmer water, during which time explosive intensification occurred. The temperatures of the ocean surface is a critical element in the formation and strength of hurricanes. There has been an overall increasing trend in July and September Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico during the past 100 years marked by two distinct periods of increasing temperatures, 1910 to 1945, 1976 to present. This pattern is similar to that observed across global land and the ocean surfaces. Also, vertical wind shear was less than normal, which allowed for the storm to develop quickly. The wind shear in the area using the 200 MB and 850 MB zonal shear anomaly was the, for the month of August 2005 with negative zonal shear anomalies. So when I started looking into the weather observations for the days prior to, during, and after Hurricane Katrina, it just goes blank. Um, which I found this very interesting. If you go to Weather Underground, you can pick a date in history, put it in, and it will give you the statistics and weather observations for that day, whether it be wind speed, humidity, rainfall. Well, I put in PQ, Mississippi, which is my hometown, and they are out of the Gulfport and Biloxi station. It just ends on August 29th, and this is due to the damage of weather equipment. So you have the days leading up to, then on the 29th on into September, it's blank. So I looked into this more and found this quote, data from many automated surface observing system sites, seaman stations and buoys are incomplete due to power outages and other weather induced failures prior to when peak winds and minimum pressures occurred. I found that very interesting because that means they really don't have a 100% accurate report of the weather system and the storm because there are some areas that were broken or um, damaged before it even hit peak wind speeds. So, and definitely after. So I found that interesting. This is a screenshot that I took. You can see it's out of the Gulfport Biloxi airport station. You can see that Obviously, we have statistics, we have readings for August 28th, and then August 29th hits onward into September completely blank. So, I really don't have a lot to show you on the weather observations. So, the storm of this magnitude, it's expected to have a lot of short-term and long-term societal impacts, and with over $1 billion in damages and the loss of life, that's not unexpected. Erosion is one. I'll get a little bit more in depth with that later on in this presentation. Loss of jobs, shortage of workers. As most of you know, there was a lot of people who were displaced. Um, a lot were sent to Texas and they just never came back. You know, there was also the fact that there was the good side of it where the debris removal, the construction business boomed afterwards. Plenty of people had jobs, including my family and myself, that we would have never had prior. A lot of money was to be made. I did see a personal change in something as simple as buying gas. You know, before Katrina, you would pump your gas and then you would go pay because you weren't sure how much your tank would cost to fill it up. But then after that, you had to prepay. And so something just as simple as that was always, you know, different afterwards. While researching, I stumbled across several studies that came years after Katrina on physical and mental health of survivors, also the mental and physical health of volunteers and emergency personnel who came to our aid. I also came across some interesting and unexpected studies of just birth rates, specifically male versus female, to Hurricane Katrina survivors in the years after. The Army Corps and the levees, the big failure there and the controversy, which I'll get into a little bit more later on as well. Diving a little bit more into the levees and the breaching, according to reports before Hurricane Katrina made landfall, one of the largest levees in New Orleans was breached. The levees and flood walls in New Orleans and the surrounding area had over 50 locations of failure and flooding 80% of the city and fully flooded 95% of St. Bernard Parish. People died and many were trapped for days. FEMA and the president said there was no way to know that this would happen, but reports dated back from 
1999 and 2002 about major storms breaking the levees and massive flooding occurring. So people didn't believe that. And then you have the bowl effect in New Orleans, which is being below sea level at six feet at the time of Katrina and being surrounded by water. That's always been a concern. It will always be a concern. And at the time of Katrina, the Army Corps of Engineers was only 60 to 90% done with a 40-year contract to redo the areas of hurricane protection systems. The Army Corps did take some of the blame later on um, for outdated engineering, and they have spent $20 billion on improving this system and building new levees and flood walls. Hopefully this will protect the area in the future, but who really knows? Um, after this, I think people just lost faith in the system and lost faith in, in their protection. And so this was a huge controversy, and it obviously resulted in a lot of unnecessary deaths. And the, the, the numbers on this, knowing that they had 40 years to do this contract and they weren't complete with it, that just blew my mind. And that was something I did not know before this presentation. I mean, I knew that the Army Corps had been working on things. I knew they were responsible. I knew all of that. But I did not know this particular detail. So I learned something there. So as I mentioned in the past, I worked for an emergency response company out of Louisiana that did debris removal. We were a general contractor, primary contractor. And my boss in that company did a ton of work after Katrina doing cleanup. And I started out as a receptionist, and then I moved into bids and contracts. And when I did, I started realizing the, the craziness and the in-depth preparation for emergency management, especially for storms and just the, just the small detail of debris cleanup. So we had contracts all over the United States. Um, we had not just for hurricanes, but for tornadoes, ice storms, all of that. And you had to really do your homework and you had very strict bids and very strict proposals. There was, you know, a lot of guidelines and you had to follow these. And if you did not, you would not get the contract. And it was very intense. And this all came after Katrina. So I really think that it showed that the government upped at the local level, at the federal level, everything. They upped their emergency preparation planning and they really took it seriously, which I'm very thankful for. According to what I read um, during this research, the sea level's rising and the global warming, this is going to mean increased storms and receding coastlines. Again, we know that the receding coastlines have always been an issue. However, then doing our lessons here in this class, it's saying that they're really not 100% saying that the global warming is going to cause increased hurricanes. So I'm interested in doing some more research on that and, and seeing how things go over the years as we learn more. A major hurricane like Katrina does a lot of lasting damage to the land. And in this photo, you can see below is Chandelier Island in Louisiana. And after Katrina is the bottom, so pre-Katrina, you can see July 17, 2001, post-Katrina, August 31st, 2005. This was permanent damage, permanent land loss, but although that is a bad thing in a lot of ways, it's not always a bad thing. Hurricanes bring in silt and things like that, so it's good and bad. As I just mentioned in the slide before, on a federal state, local level, everyone kind of boosted their emergency preparedness and emergency response systems. There was more jobs, more grants, better infrastructure, more contracts, more education, and more advanced technology. So I looked into my home county in Mississippi, Pearl River County, and their emergency director has an app that is paid for by the state that the community can download. And it's an emergency program that was created after or like mimicking one that California used for wildlife, wildfires. The app tracks the storm, uses real-time updates, keeps the community aware of changes, locations of shelter. Um, it is used constantly and they are training on it constantly. He said this is not something that they just created and it's sitting on the back burner. Like every year they are constantly working on this plan and they are constantly using it, even for smaller, um, minor emergency situations. 
So I think that's amazing that they have that. And it's actually pretty awesome because I don't even know if my family is aware of that. So that's something I want to share with them because you just never know, especially after 2020 and this hurricane season. It's good to have all of your ducks in a row. So this slide and the next slide are personal family photos from my cousin Nicole that were taken in September of 2005 of her home. As you can see, they had severe destruction, um, total losses on this home. And unfortunately, this side of my family had a lot of, of damage and a lot of homes that they lost. So this was a, a very unfortunate time for them. They struggled. Um, now they are actually not even in this city anymore. They are in Covington, Louisiana and doing very well and I'm happy for them. I was not able to find the personal photos that I had of our home, so I'm very grateful that she gave me these to present today. So in conclusion, I think you can see that, you know, obviously this was a massive storm. It was a devastating storm. It was very expensive and very deadly. And a lot of things had to happen just so for it to intensify so quickly. The levee failures were devastating and unnecessary, but it brought to light a lot of the weaknesses in the system. And I think that we've been able to learn a lot from this storm. Also, it brought to light more about coastal erosion, which is something that's been a problem and will continue to be a problem that we need to be prepared for and, and understand and educate ourselves on. So I think it kind of relates to what we're going through now with this pandemic. Obviously, you know, COVID is a global issue, but I think with all of the, the loss of life and the loss of, of money and economy and the devastation that this has brought to us, I think we are going to learn a lot and we're going to come out of this understanding things better and being more prepared for something like this. So I think that as long as we keep learning from our mistakes and we keep growing and educating ourselves that no matter what the emergency may be, we can come out of it better and we can save lives in the future if we just learn from our mistakes. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And I look forward to listening to everyone else's. Thank you so much. I had a great, great semester in this class.